Okay, good. Um, uh, I want to be sure we're all on the same page. Uh, public money that goes into the funding of census, I'm uh, sorry, of science. Um, is there anyone that thinks that that allows the government then to tell us what kind of science to do? I, uh, uh, so hold that idea for a second, because that really has a lot of bearing on, on, on the census. Um, uh, uh, it's not true that I'm going to talk about gerrymandering today, because every day for the last four weeks I've had to change my mind about what's going on in the census. Uh, uh, literally, I gave this talk in Cambridge a bit of it uh, a week ago. That was it was different from when it was what it was in my head when I was first asked to give this title and so forth and so on. Um, and so today, I'm going to start with the New York Times, about four or five days ago, which has an above the fold front page story. You can't see it. Don't worry. Partisan roots on the census. Well, what do you mean partisan roots on the census? The census doesn't itself have anything to do with partisanship. Uh, the Constitution, as we just saw from, from Margo, says, you know, count everybody. On the other hand, we do have these footnotes, 60%, uh, uh, of course, for the African-American slave population and untaxed citizens, uh, Indians, leave them out. But other than that, it's a fairly straightforward uh, uh, exercise. Um, now. And, and we're supposed to do this as Congress sort of thinks this through, and the Congress has never, ever imagined that uh, we could be selective in who we counted. We don't say, well, this count tall people but not short people, or uh, this count Virginians but not New Yorkers. Uh, there's been no presumption that you would be selective with respect to who would be counted um, in the census. Um, uh, indeed, the way the Census Bureau says this to themselves is we count everyone, that is, there's no undercount, only once, no overcount, and in the right place in order to portion. The purpose of the census, count everyone only once in the right place. Now, how in the world could something so simple as that become partisan? Well, it's not its intention to be a partisan, but is it, it is its consequence. The more people you count in the country today, the more you benefit the Democratic Party. By definition, if you counted everyone, you would benefit the Democratic Party quite disproportionately to the Republican Party. That's just a fact. It has nothing to do with the census. It's just simply a fact of the nature of the country right now. Um, the benefits come in two forms. They come in the form of power, i.e. electoral college votes and, and house seats. And they come in the form of money, big money. Uh, the census will allocate something like $9 trillion between uh, 2020 and 2030, if we have a census that's reported and so forth. So that's the, that's the assumption in terms of how much money uh, will be allocated. I, I, in, in 2000, I had an advertisement um, that I love, but they wouldn't let me use it. It was a picture of the Census Bureau, and it said, um, uh, or the, uh, the Census uh, form and the IRS form. And under the IRS form, it said, this taketh away, and under the census, this giveth back. <laughs> and, um, uh, uh, but in effect, that is true. Uh, uh, the money goes into the federal government, comes back as grants and program money and so forth in large, large numbers, say $9 trillion across the country in the next 10 years. Um, now, it's proportional when it comes back, and, and Margo, of course, made this point uh, as well. If we had a really lousy census and only counted half of the population, the Census Bureau would be embarrassed. It would be a big failure at one level. However, if you counted exactly 50% of every one of the 11 million blocks, the census would work. The same number of seats would be allocated, the same amount of monies, proportionality would be allocated as would be if you counted 100% of the population. So the issue is not how many you count, it's whether the count is differential. And once it's differential, then you have created winners and losers. And we've had a big battle over the last half century about the differential undercount. People who are missed are not like the people who are sometimes overcounted. People in this room are more likely to be overcounted, as a matter of fact. Um, and people who are more likely to be undercounted are not in this room. Uh, and uh, so 
that's what draws a political attention to, to the census, is the differential nature of the count as you're roaming across the country and so forth. It's not by design, that's just a consequence. Now, so I asked myself, when I became Census Bureau Director, um, I was worried, there was a big battle going on in 2000, I'm not gonna repeat all that stuff about it, whether we use sampling or not and so forth. It was a very politicized census. Um, and, and so I was, came as a director and I said to myself, what, there's a lot of talk in the air about political interference in the census. And so I said, what, what is it? What, is, what, is, what would constitute political interference in the census? Which in a sense was asking myself the question, what would I be told to do that I would have to resign for? That's my only power. Uh, it's the Watergate phenomenon, of course. Uh, the only thing you can do is walk. Um, and so I said, at what point would I say I can't, no, what if the Congress came along and said, you know, we think it's time to count the number of um, internet connection? Well, I, I would say, well, sure, okay, we'll try to do that. Or we well, just don't go to the LGBT uh, route quite yet, maybe someday, but not this instance. I, would, I wouldn't feel like that was interfering. So at what point, what is the line between congressional oversight and um, uh, 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 political interference? Now, I want to repeat what Margot said about the Constitution. Actual enumeration should be made within three years, blah, 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 in such manner as Congress shall by law direct. Now, that seems like a pretty overwhelming burden for the director to be carrying. It makes it quite clear that the Congress has the right to, to design the census. So I'm, I'm anxious about what in the world, how, I, how well I would behave if I felt like I was being pushed around um, by, by, uh, by, by, by the Congress uh, to an effect. I, I, in fact, I, 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 um, I, I reported at some level. I, I testified in, in a little over two years, 27 times uh, before the Congress. I think it's a record. Uh, the, the Congress is really interested in the census when you get that close to it, by the way. Um, so I had to work up for myself, what was the definition of political interference? Wrote a little article about it, and this is what I said. The politically motivated suppression of an agency's responsibility to offer its best judgment on how to most accurately and reliably measure a given phenomenon. Two, the politically motivated decision to prevent an agency from using state-of-the-art science. Finally, the politically motivated insistence on pre-clearance of a major statistical product that is based on state-of-the-art science. In other words, anything that interfered with the census's ability to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place, I would interpret as political interference, because that's, after all, what it plays out in the constitutional language and, and so forth. Now, um, in order to make that formula work in my head and feel relaxed about all this task, um, I drew a big line between the production of the count and the numbers and the use of them. The use is always political. It was put in the Constitution to be political. Apportionment is political. Spending money is political. So it has nothing to do with what happens to the numbers. It has to do with the process of producing them. And so any interference that told we scientists that using our best judgment, this is the way the census should be conducted. And any preclearance in which I would take the numbers down to the, uh, somebody first and say, in the BLS, we don't take those numbers down, we announce the, the, the labor statistics as soon as they come out, in the BEA, GNP, whatever it is, we don't take that number some boss someplace and say, what do you think of this number? We just sent it out according to a schedule that was predetermined and so forth. And no one ever argued about that. Pause and remember, and I'll get back to this at the very end, what the Census Bureau director does after the count, he or she sends the number to the White House. By practice, we report the results of a census count to the President of the United States. So, uh, Bear in mind that the current census is happening in a moment of high polarization, high anger, all that sort of stuff. I won't go through that in any detail. Um, and I want to now talk a little bit about what 
it will mean or not mean in terms of what's happening to, to, for me to sort of say this census has been interfered with and we ought to do something about it. Let me tell you that something that I do not think is, is interference, uh, and this goes to, again, something that, that Margot said, um, uh, and this is the attempt to, um, I'll, I'll just read this quickly. Because illegal aliens should not even be in the country, and other non-immigrants such as foreign students and guest workers are only here temporarily, it makes no sense to distribute congressional, congressional seats as if these foreign nationals deserved representation the same as the American citizens. This comes out of a very clever think tank that's thinking all these things through. The population that should logically be enumerated includes U.S. citizens and legal permanent residents, count them, but no one here illegally, and because only the former, that is the actual citizens, vote in federal elections, the apportionment of seats in Congress should be done on the basis of the number of U.S. citizens in each state. That is now churning along, as Margot said, it has a history, it's churning along now with some, some energy and so forth. It's because immigrants tend to settle in states that vote Democratic, and therefore they simply shift power to the Democratic Party. Um, indeed, if citizens only had been counted in 2020, California would have lost five seats, and other blue states would have lost another three or four seats. Ten seats would have moved from, from blue, to red, uh, blue to red seats. Uh, if, if, we, if we'd actually only counted U.S. citizens, only put the U.S., not only counted, I'm sorry, only put them in, in the apportionment count. Put this a different way, 40, 44, 40, whatever, 40 million immigrants, let us say, on average, moved 18 seats in the 2020 census. 16 of them went to states that Obama won. So there's no doubt about it. If you count everybody in the country, you're going to give a benefit to the Democratic Party. Um, and there's, by the way, this doesn't work out very well with one person, one vote either, because you're now giving them to states where, there are, where the citizen population is much more dense and the non-citizen population uh, is, is much higher. And, uh, and so you, the one person, one, uh, one vote, one person doesn't, formula doesn't work very well. Now, the birthright thing is connected to this. And um, here's another quote from, again, a very active group. Strong arguments for limiting birthright citizenship, discouraging illegal elimination, uh, immigration, limiting the cost to taxpayers, reducing national security risk, and enhancing US citizenship. So that is also very much in play, whether we're going to actually change the way in which birthright citizenship is currently um, allocated. Um, the, um, uh, some people say that will take a, a, uh, a constitutional amendment. That's not the judgment of, of Richard Posner, uh, who says a constitutional amendment may be required to change the rule whereby birth in this country automatically confers U.S. citizens, but I doubt it. He says, to amend the immigration, you will only have to amend the Immigration and Nationality Act to deny citizenship to, at birth to, to uh, children born in the United States, um, and, but, but not of anybody who's not, a, not of any parents who themselves are not, are not citizens. Um, and if you read the 14th Amendment, one way, this is not going to be constitutional, but there's a different way to read it, which, which really suggests that it could be constitutional, and it really has to do with the phasing of the, of, there's a, Part one of the 14th Amendment says, uses the word citizenship in describing what we're trying to sort out here, and that's part two that takes the word citizenship out of that formula, but it, you can read that as they, they really had in mind the citizens, and that's what Posner is getting. So from my point of view about interference, the including legally setting aside a different number for the apportionment count. And, and doing something about birthright citizenship is not political interference in the census. It is within the, the, the purview, if you will, of the congressional and legal system uh, to come to these decisions and do it. So then what constitutes interference? If something is as big as that, which would actually change the apportionment counts, rearrange the distribution of numbers and dollars and so forth, what constitutes, uh, for me, adding the citizenship question to the census at a late date constitutes political interference. It certainly has partisan implications. Uh, um, the, the citizenship question itself gets a non-response rate of about five or six percent. 
That, that's very high for, for skipping a question. It's three times higher than anything else in the census in terms of not even being answered. And households, which have non-citizens in the household, based not on the current conversation, this goes back to 2016, uh, the, uh, there's a big drop off, five to seven percent. People just don't turn the forms back in at all if they have non-citizens non uh, in the household. That's a very large number in the census, five, seven, six or seven percent, and that's not the only people we, met, we miss. There are all kinds of other people, language reasons, mobility reasons, so forth. So you're now looking at a census to get into the up, upper single digits, even up to 10% of, of simply household non-refusal. A um, lot of other data on that. Uh, there's a Hispanic poll that 68% of Latinos think the, the census will be used directly against them as in, in, if they don't have citizens in the, in the household and so forth. 7% of the U.S. residents are non-citizens. 14% of the, all U.S. residents live in a household with at least one non-citizen. 45% of Hispanics and Asians live in a household with at least one non-citizen. 45% of these two big population groups uh, have a non-citizen uh, in the household. Um, uh, Houston, for example, as, as I just read a big article about that, and the title of that article is Houston $6 billion census problem. Frightened immigrants. And they get to the six billion by simply figuring out that for every person missed in Texas, $1,161 in federal funds will be subtracted from their budget every year. Houston took that number, multiplied it by the number of unauthorized immigrants in the, in the, in the city, and they came up to six billion dollars that it's gonna cost the city budget. Lots of things will happen. Hospitals, transportation systems, schools, all of that money will, will rip through all kinds of social programs and so forth. Um, there's no doubt that the border states uh, uh, will, will be hit hard by this. This is again a quote from uh, the Texans. Uh, as long as the census is perceived as a means of potentially enforcing immigration laws, it will be difficult to overcome the potential for undercounting. The mayor says, I promise you to the citizens of, of Houston, no one is going to take information and use it against you or your family members. Yeah, good luck, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> uh, he can't control that. Um, uh, so, so here's where I want to wind all of this up. I want to return to the idea of what causes a, a partisan census. If the intention is to shift political power from one party to another, and you use the process of how you count to do that, the rules of counting, the conditions of counting, and so forth, then you are now, in a, in, for partisan reasons, beginning to try to shift the results of, a census, uh, of the census, and that, by definition, shifts the results, of course, uh, across the election system. Um, uh, it, it, the, the, the census is the largest applied political uh, uh, social science project in American history. Um, and in effect, it's, it's, it's interfering with our uh, um, capacity to do the census in the Census Bureau the way we think it has to be done. Um, I wish that I could not report this. I, when the first citizenship first came up, I said, look, there's good reasons. People are arguing about this and so forth and so on. And uh, then they came up with this uh, Voting Rights Act thing. Many of you watch the press on this. You know about all this. But not until uh, the press went to work on this till we begin to learn some really important things. January 2017th, that's when the new administration has first come to town. And there already is a report floating around in the intricacies of the administration um, about using the citizenship question politically. Um, that goes on and on, and then a year later, when it, when, when, uh, I, I got a quote here from the Census Bureau, um, they have been asking for a meeting with the Congress, the, uh, the um, uh, Commerce people about talking this through because it's not, it's not going to work. Um, uh, we're going to have a less good census than we had. They never got that, um, uh, that meeting ever in that entire year of, of, of arguing about that. Um, the uh, chief statist statistician uh, at, at, the, at the Bureau as, as late as January 2018, just uh, uh, early in this year. 
a questionship, citizenship question is very costly, harms the quality of the census count, and would use substantially, le substantially less accurate citizenship data that are available. They came up with a model that would work. So they simply denied the right of the professionals to actually help shape the nature of this particular part of the census. That, it seems to me, is interfering with the census. Now, um, there's something larger at stake uh, than just how well the census uh, works itself. And that is, if you actually create a sense that the census can be partisan, we're finished. <laughs> the numbers won't, not, neither side will ever appreciate that the other side is getting, getting, getting us decent numbers. Uh, it means that the government will be not, not in charge of the, of the number system. It'll move to the, the corporations, the private producers, and so forth. The commercial section doesn't want to use bad data, misleading data. They'll get their own data, one way or the other. So I think this is a real juncture uh, for the census. Um, if we can't somehow sanitize or immunize it um, from political interference, and then I go back to what I just hinted at in a second. Um, if the number goes down to the White House uh, after it's all ready and sometime in early December, I don't know what will happen. Uh, uh, and there is no control, of course, over that. No judicial control or legislative control. Um, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, this, this thing isn't going to go away um, over the next year and a half. Um, but I do think it has real consequences for the things that bring us together in this room. How do we use good data, good science, good knowledge in order to govern a, a, a democratic country? Thank you. <laughs> Very disquieting. Yes. Uh, Rich Ifrin, Indiana University. I'm sort of interested in the practical application. Um, to what degree um, can uh, Congress implement changes in the current system of the census, of census uh, prior to the new Congress coming into place? Can the executive introduce changes on their own without Congress taking action? Maybe they already are. And uh, what are the likely uh, prospects that there'll be any changes once the new Congress comes into uh, force? Yeah, um, okay, the, the statutory authorization for the decennial census is called Title 13 of the United States Code. So um, there is a lot of ambiguity here in the sense that the, the code delegates from Congress to the Commerce Secretary, to the Census Bureau, and its scientific staff, the method of taking the census. The, because there's a lot of, um, you know, Congress very rarely modifies uh, Title 13. I mean, it, it you know, there, there was a law passed in 94, there were major revisions in 76, before that in 54, right? So it's every 20 years. 20 years or so. So the, um, we're probably going to be working with t Title 13 as it exists. The shenanigans are what goes on um, in uh, the agency, in the Commerce Department and the Bureau, in the administrative agency, and then whether the new Congress, particularly the House, ha which has oversight responsibility for um, the census, um, will in fact start holding hearings. The traditional way that the, that the Congress sort of watches over a census process is with the whatever the House Census Committee or the Senate Census Committee or whatever it's called. Um, it, it's a subcommittee of government reform and they haul people in and, you know, and have them testify under oath. Of course, that hasn't happened in the last two years. That's exactly what hasn't happened. It will starting in January. So you, you were, you've been a well, victim of I'll that. Just, well, <laughs> um, uh, well, yes, I'm going to pause on that for a second and, and, and tell you. I, I did spend a lot of time uh, being interrogated and, and, and under oath in front of the uh, uh, Congress in, in, the 20, in 1998, 99, leading the census, uh, by a man named Miller, Congressman Miller. This was, after all, a Republican. He was the Republican and um, uh, co-chair of their chair of the uh, subcommittee. Um, and uh, I, just pounding away and so forth and so on. However, and this is what m made 2000 feel different from today. However, 
Congressman Miller called me up one day and said, you know, I'm going to be down in Florida. I'm going to be down in my state. Can you come down and go to some schools with me? And I said, sure. We, we were jointly committed to a good census. And we went to the school, and we talked to the kids, and they had materials, and they couldn't, they were telling their parents about how important the census is and so forth. There was no doubt that we differed about a particular, whether we should use dual system estimation or not, uh, but we didn't differ about the importance of having a complete count, the best possible count. In 2000, that's only 20 years ago. That's what is not happening today. That's the big difference. I think we may have time for only one more question up, up in the balcony. Hi, uh, Linda Kerber, uh, University of Iowa. I didn't catch and didn't take a note, but um, Ken Pruitt had a litany of reasons why people who want the, cen the citizenship question on the census now mm -hmm. uh, thought it would be an improvement for the country. And one of it was uh, pro protection, security, uh, getting alien voices out of the mix. And this is a point to say that if we do that, and if we destabilize birthright citizenship, one of the outcomes is that we are going to have large numbers of stateless people in the United States, because we'll have all those children who are now born in the United States who are citizens at birth. And that is one place where the United States is, is an outlier, increasingly, and is one piece of American exceptionalism that we must protect, I believe, um, with, with our bodies. Uh, because uh, having a lot, we, a lot wrong with this country, but we don't have a lot of stateless people in it. And we risk that if we move in the direction we seem to be moving. Uh, that's well said. I would only summarize or comment as follows. It's a global problem. We're creating statelessness, permanent refugee camps that are going to life the entire life of, of, of families. We're creating, and we allow, we allow some people to buy citizenship, and then we, it's a serious, big, global problem. The number of people in this world who will not have the rights of citizenship. And it's true in the Emirates, of course. 87% uh, of the population and so forth. So for the United States to be part of that, which I think is quite possible, is deeply, deeply sad. Can I ask, can I ask one, uh, add one thing, um, which we haven't said? We do have good data on the citizen, the alien, and the undocumented immigrant populations in this country collected by the Census Bureau. It's collected on a sample. It work, it's, and it's one of the reasons why people like us have been kind of surprised because it's been collected for decades, and it's perfectly good data. No one ever before two years ago said that the Voting Rights Act needed this something different. So we know the numbers, and, and that's an important question to be able to measure the magnitude of the potential um, problems that we could, if we, if we go down um, the rabbit hole that is being discussed. Uh, Joel Cohn. Thank you for two very well-informed and very disturbing presentations. I believe that there was a question on the U.S. Census about the citizenship of people in the household until either 1950 or 60. I'm, I'm not sure which decade it went off. Can you tell us anything about the arguments that were used to remove that yeah, question sure. from the census yeah. and whether those arguments have any relevance yes. to today? Right. Please. This is actually a story about probability sampling. Um, um, in other words, the, there was no um, good statistical methodology for probability sampling until the mid-20th century. I mean, the Census Bureau pioneered in that as well. And so that uh, until uh, 1940, basically, if you wanted to ask a question on the census, you had to ask everybody. And so that the, the, citizen sh the, the question of, about citizen was in, in some form or another, actually it was, are you an alien, um, was on the form uh, off and on, you know, going back to 1820. What happened in the 50s and 60s is that the methodology of probability sampling um, developed. It meant that almost everything went off the, what is called the complete count census, and we created two 
method, two systems. One, a short form. The other used to be called the long form. It's now called the American Community Survey. That's where our data now comes from. So it wasn't, it wasn't about taking, it, it went off the census almost complete, completely in 1960 because there weren't very many immigrants left. You know, it was before the 65 wave. But it wasn't an issue about the politics of it. It was, the, it was an issue about the development of sampling methodology and the, um, and the efficiency of doing it uh, with sample methods. Yeah, and I do want to just come back with a yeah. sentence because it's really critical, uh, Joe. Um, look, this, the so-called short form only has six questions or so, age, gender, whatever. It's where you need block level data. You do not need block level data for almost anything. If you've got really good data down to the level of 15 to 20,000 people, you got enough granularity, demographic granularity, and so forth, much, much less expensive to do a sample as the sort of thing. However, we have now, I'm, I'm going now a little bit over, um, I'm taking a risk when I say this publicly, <laughs> uh, is my point. But nevertheless, um, we have now had some people that really have dug in to the memos and all that kind of stuff, some of which has been redacted all over the place, but there's a lot of stuff in there about what really happened starting in. in to, and there is no doubt in the, in the minds of people who are looking at this that you want a block level data on the non citizens. And now they're going to get no data instead of block level data, uh, period. But the, the, you cannot interpret the kinds of questions they are asking the Census Bureau to respond to other than they want granular data on non-citizens. And, and the illegals have been including all non-citizens. That is only useful if you want to go after individuals. It's not useful to make public policy about immigration. That's scary. OK, I think we have to stop for our break. A few minutes of coffee and...